Well, I am blessed to be here. You know, uh, last year, I was not involved in an interim, and I was not in doing any supply work on Easter Sunday. I was at my church in, uh, in Milton, where I'd pastored. That was the first time in sometime over 40 years that I'd not preached on Easter Sunday. So I want to thank y'all that I get to preach on Easter Sunday this week, this year. Um, I, um, it's such a great day. It is, uh, it is the victory day. It is the, the highest day, the biggest day for all of us as believers. Uh, you know, I, I came today without my wife. She is at uh, our church where I pastored. She's at church with our children grandchildren so uh, they could be together for church today and we're going to have lunch together like I'm sure many of you are when I could get home from from here today and uh but uh when I was walking out the door that's what she shared with me I sure I hate that I can't be with you today and uh but she is uh she's back there uh going to be attending the I think the 1045 service there would you take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, and we're going to be looking at verses 12 uh, through uh, 20 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm asking the question this morning, what if uh, there had been no Easter? You ever thought about that? What if there had been no Easter? What if Jesus had not raised from the dead? That he died on the cross and then that was it. And uh, he never raised from the dead. What would it be like? You know, Dr. Adrian Rogers calls this the unthinkable question. Uh, you know, um, th that what if, uh, if Jesus stayed in the tomb? What, what if uh, death conquered him? Uh, you know, as we turn to this passage of Scripture today, uh, just to kind of set the context of this passage, this is the 15th chapter, of course, of 1 Corinthians, and Paul is writing to the believers there in you, you, as you know, if you studied Corinthians, you know that Corinth was a very troubled church for many reasons, a lot of different things that were going on there. But, but Corinth was, of course, uh, a, a city that was located, it was a Greek city. And um, Greeks did not believe in the resurrection of the body. That is the bodily resurrection, the literal event that's going to take place one day when uh, when Jesus comes back for us and uh, the body is, will be raised to, to be changed to like his body. And so uh, when Paul, in fact, when he preached uh, the resurrection of the dead in, in Athens, um, in Acts chapter 17, verse 32, the scriptures tell us that they mocked him or literally they laughed at him, this Greek city, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And uh, so this skeptical attitude had, you know, crept into the church because all, all the time, and, and this is something that every one of us needs to be aware of, that whatever is happening in our world, whatever is going on, and uh, the, the kind of the flow of society and all the things that are out there, those things can very easily get to be a part of what we do. They can creep into the church. And that's what was happening there. And so uh, Paul writes the 15th chapter that, that is really uh, just really a, a complete answer to this issue of the resurrection of the bodily, of the body, a bodily resurrection. In, in fact, I, I don't know what I would say at, at funerals at gravesides hardly if I didn't have this chapter. Uh, that uh, that Paul gives to us here. So sometimes, uh, when the problems happened in these churches, we can be we can be grateful because of some of those because we have such wonderful uh, answers here that uh, we get from the Scripture. But I want you to look with me as we read together, beginning in verse twelve. So I've kind of set the context for you that he is writing on this issue. Then we pick it up in verse twelve. And so he says, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? And you heard that. If Christ is proclaimed, you're, you're saying Jesus was raised, but now you're saying there is no bodily resurrection. 
But then he said this, he said, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Would you bow with me and pray? Heavenly Father, we just ask you, Lord, this morning, by the guidance of your Holy Spirit, that you would help us, Lord. Help us to be clear. Help us, Lord, to, Lord, to just hear from you that you today would be our teacher, that you would be our preacher. And Lord, I pray that we would listen with a heart that's willing to obey. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me, be the, let me just be here at the beginning and just kind of first say to you, Jesus did come out of that tomb, amen? And we are worshiping today a living Savior. Resurrection, folks, is of first importance. Dr. Billy Graham said uh, several years ago in Time magazine, he said that if I were an enemy of Christianity, I would aim right at the resurrection because that is the heart of Christianity. And Dr. Graham was exactly right, folks. He was absolutely right because, you see, liberal theologians have been and still are taking dead aim at the resurrection of Jesus. They're going to the very heart of what we believe is the truth. In fact, the, the founder of what is uh, what was called the, the Jesus Seminar, maybe you've studied about that, you know about that, it was something in the, in the 80s, the 90s, it moved all the way into the 21st century, and, and uh, a man by the name of Dr. Robert Funk is the one who founded the Jesus Seminar. I want you to hear what he said. He said, the tales of entombment and resurrection were latter-day wishful thinking. Instead, Jesus' corpse went the way of all abandoned criminal bodies. It was probably barely covered with dirt, vulnerable to wild dogs that roamed the wastelands of the execution grounds. The infamous Jesus Seminar. Dr. N.T. Wright, who is identified in the media as a, quote, conservative, said this, he said, I think the resurrection of Jesus really happened, but I have no idea if it, involved, uh, if it involves anything happening to his corpse, and therefore I have no idea whether it involves an empty tomb. So I would have no problem whatsoever if archaeologists found the corpse of Jesus. For me, that would not be discrediting the Christian faith or the Christian tradition. Can you believe that? I, I want you to think about this. What if you were to get up one morning and uh, you turn on this, you know, news that we have from everywhere uh, out there, and the major headline of the news that day and all across the world, the major headline of major newspapers was this, Body of Jesus Discovered in Israel, Christianity in chaos. What would that mean? What would it mean? I mean, just what would be the ramifications of that? What would be the, the implications if the body of Jesus were found? Well, we know that it would mean something for the church. It would mean something for Christ. It would mean something for us as individual Christians. And so that's what I really wanted to talk about this morning. What would it be like if there had been no Easter? Well, without Easter, first of all, we would have no message, folks. No message. Here's what he says in, in verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. In other words, preaching is then an exercise in futility 
if Christ is still in the grave. And I want you to know this morning, if Jesus Christ is still in the grave, if he is as dead today as he was the day they took him off of the cross, then I want you to know that basically for 50 years of my life in ministry, I have played the fool. I wasted my time going to a Christian university to get a degree. I've wasted my time getting a couple of degrees from, from the, the two different seminaries. And I would have to go to my house and go in my office and then go to the place where I've got books stored and I would have to throw them all away because they all proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, I'd be just like uh, Adrian Rogers. He said that every liberal preacher who doesn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus should go and get an honest job. <laughs> You see, what does the Scripture tell us? If you go back in, the, in verses 3 and 4 of this same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. You see, without the resurrection, folks, we have no gospel to preach. We have no message. If Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, then I'm wasting my time preaching, and you're wasting your time listening. And the truth of the matter is, is with, just like Dr. James Merritt said, he said the truth of the matter is, if Jesus Christ is still dead, then bonnets and bunnies make more sense than the cradle and the cross. You know, I heard about a little six-year-old boy who complained to his mother, and he's just complaining a, he was complaining of his stomach hurting, and she said, well, son, you're, it's because your stomach's empty. If you put something in it, you, you'll feel better. Well, later on that afternoon, the preacher came over, and the little boy asked the preacher, how you feeling? He says, well, son, I'm okay, but my head hurts. <laughs> yeah. He said, well, it's empty. If you put something in it, you'd feel better. Well, preaching without a risen Savior is empty. He said it is in vain. It's meaningless. I've got nothing to say to you, and you've got nothing to come and hear. But I do have something to say. I do have something to say, and I want to say it, and I want to say it plain and say it clear. You know, through the years, people will come up to me and say, Mike, you know, I appreciate the fact that you make things kind of simple, and I always tell them, I operate with the KISS principle. You know what that is? There's a nice way to say it and an ugly way to say it, but I, I say keep it simple somehow. And I tell them this, I've got to keep it simple because I've got to understand it. And i got to get it so I can understand it. So I always want to be clear. And today, my prayer all this week has been, Lord, help me to be clear in what I say today, this day. Every, every time I get up and preach, I'm asking the Lord, help me be clear because sometimes, folks, we say things that we really don't mean or we write things in a way that we really don't mean it. I, I was reading some of the, you know, advertisements that, I, that were actually in newspaper, and one of them was, it says, antique desk for sale, suitable for lady with thick legs and large drawers. <laughs> uh, another, one, another one said, illiterate, asking the question, illiterate? Write today for free material. Or dry cleaners. We never tear your clothing with the machinery. We, we do it by hand. You see, that's not saying what's really there. That's not saying what you really mean. You see, if I can't get up here and say that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and mean that and mean and know and believe that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, then preaching is in vain. He said, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. In fact, he then went on and said in verse 15, and he says, and we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he, it, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. And let me ask you a question. You, you don't have to raise your hand literally. You can kind of just raise it in your heart if you will. But how many of you here today would say, Jesus Christ has changed my life? How many of you would say that Jesus Christ lives in your life? How many of you would say that I have a living 
breathing, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, and if you answered that, and you answered that in the affirmative, I want you to listen carefully. If you did that, and if Jesus is dead, then you are guilty of spiritual perjury if Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead. For here's what he said, we are found misrepresenting God. You know what the word there is? The word is, uh, is false witness. And, and in fact, those two words uh, in the English translation uh, is the English translation of, of a, one Greek word, and the Greek word that it translates is pseudo martis. Now, pseudo simply means false. In other words, if a person, uh, you know, a, a pseudo intellectual is someone who thinks he's smart, but he's not. A pseudonym is a, is a false name. And the other half of that word, that other half of the word, is where we get our word martyr from. And now the, the original idea of a martyr was not someone who died for a cause. The original idea of a martyr was just someone who was a witness. And so what it literally means is, if we're saying that and Jesus has not been raised from the dead, we are false witnesses. Now, folks, what I want to tell you is it's something to be mistaken and be false. But you see here, it's another thing to be a false witness. For we, you are simply saying here what Paul said, if Jesus is still in the grave, then we are lying. We're not telling the truth. It would mean the disciples were liars because they said they saw him. They touched him. They were with him. And why would they be deceived in that way? You see, folks, people, people lie to gain something. The disciples died as martyrs. The early followers of Christ were tortured, persecuted, humiliated, burned at the stake, eaten by lions, stoned, and crushed to death. Listen, folks, people lie to get out of trouble, not to get into trouble, right? A man may live for a lie, but very few will willingly die for a lie. The disciples were testifying that Jesus is alive. They said, we have seen him, we have touched him. We've talked to him. In fact, folks, it's worse than all of that. You see, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then the greatest liar in history and the biggest religious charlatan that has ever existed in the world would be Jesus himself. If Jesus Christ is not alive, he would not deserve our empathy, our sympathy. He would deserve our anger. Because you see, what did he say? In Matthew 17, verses 22 and 23, it says that now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said this to them, talking to his disciples, he said, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. He would be telling something that wasn't true. You see, the problem with a Christ that is not a lie is we would have no message would nothing secondly not only would we have no message but we would have no mission i want you to listen to what the scripture says in verse 17 in, and it tells us what our, our as we will look at that in just a moment but i want to first of all just say what is our mission what is our mission as a church well we, we've got it pretty plain it's, it's pretty plain matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What is our mission? Our mission is to tell people about Jesus, right? Our mission is to help people to come to know Jesus in a saving relationship. And the problem is, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, if Jesus is not alive, our faith is irrelevant. And that's what he said here. In verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sin. You see, folks, your faith is no greater than its object, right? It's not our faith that saves us. It's Jesus that saves us. You don't get enough faith and, and then Jesus saves you. You're saved by grace, 
Jesus is the one who saves you. And all the faith in the world, all the faith in the world will not keep you from falling to your death. If you jump out of an airplane without a parachute, you're still going to fall, right? What gives faith credibility is the object in which it is placed. You know, uh, there's a story that some of you may have read about. You can Google this and find it. There's a, there was a man several years ago. He was known as the, the human fly. And what he would do is he would find these skyscrapers. He was out of the Los Angeles, and he would find these skyscrapers, and he would climb them. He, he would just scale up them, no, no ropes, nothing, just going up the side of these uh, skyscrapers. And, uh, and on one particular day, he was climbing the wall of this huge department store in Los Angeles. And there was a crowd of people that were watching him, and the police were waiting on the top when he get, would get to the top, you know, because he wasn't supposed to be doing this. And, and there was a ledge. You know, he'd gotten up there. He was almost to the top. And there was this ledge that was up there, and it was, uh, you know, a, a little higher. There was this protrusion that was coming out, and he needed to get up to that. And, and it was just outside of his grasp. And so he decided that what he would do is he would just take just a little jump, and he would let, grab that protrusion. Well, you, you know, if you climb skyscrapers, that's no big deal, right? So, so he, he takes that jump, and he grabs it. And when he does, he falls to his death. Well, the story is that they went over to his body, they gathered around him, and they opened up his hand that was in a fist. And there they found the crust of a spider's web. What this man thought was a brick was nothing more than a spider's web. Well, listen, folks. If Jesus Christ is not risen... He's not the Son of God, and He's not the Rock of Ages. He's no more solid than a spider's web. You see, what gives meaning to the birth of Jesus is the life of Jesus. What gives meaning to the life of Jesus is the death of Jesus. Because if He had not given His sinless life as a sacrifice for our sins, dying on the cross then there would be no forgiveness for us. His sinless death would be meaningless. But you see what gives meaning to the death of Jesus. Hear me, it's the resurrection of Jesus. Because if he has not been raised from the dead, then he could not be who he said he was. And therefore, his birth, his life, and his death would be all meaningless. In other words, without an empty tomb, the cross means nothing. Sin would have won. Sin would be soft. And if Christ be not raised from the dead, he said, your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. Listen, I want to tell you, all of us are sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? There's none righteous, no, not one. We're sinners by birth, by nature, by practice, and by choice. We have no hope of forgiveness apart from the death of, the Lord Je of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing we got to understand. Even though the world may give you a Christ who just kind of looks the other way when you sin, he just overlooks your sin. Listen, if God stopped judging sin, he would cease to be holy. If God, ne uh, God folks, never let sin go unpunished. Your, your sin is either going to be pardoned what, by what Christ did for you, or it's going to be punished in hell. But it will never be overlooked. That's why Paul said in Romans 4, 25, he said that he was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. It's as simple as this, folks. No resurrection, no Savior. No Savior, no forgiveness. His death without the resurrection cannot save anybody. If Christ is still in the grave, we have no hope of heaven. We have no, no, uh, we are yet in our sins because the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, separation from God. You know, 
I've never been to the Orient, but I was reading something uh, by uh, James Merritt this week, and he was talking about in the Oriental marketplace. Oftentimes you see people walk up to a counter and they see some merchandise that they like, and they'll take that whatever it is, and they will take it over to a table that has tables having various values. And they will take it there where they feel what is the worth of that merchandise. And if the price is acceptable to the seller, the seller will raise his hand. Means you you can buy it. May I tell you today, folks, that when God raised Jesus from the dead. He was raising his hand to the lost world and saying, I accept the price of my son, Jesus Christ, that he paid for you on the cross for your sins. And the empty tomb is God's receipt that Jesus has paid it all, folks. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. But if he's not raised, we have no message and we have no mission. But lastly, we have no ministry. Now, look with me at verse 18. He said, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, we have no ministry, either to the living or to the dying. We can offer no hope. No hope. And Paul says it there, verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. You know what he means by that? He's talking about people that that means perish means no hope, dead without hope if if christ has not been raised there is no hope it means that death still has its sting it means that the grave still has its victory and if jesus has not been raised from the dead there's no hope now and there's no hope of heaven later your loved ones that you've lost they're lost forever when you buried your mother or your father And it didn't matter if they were godly, if they had trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior and lived for Him or not. In fact, I want to tell you something, folks. If Jesus had not raised from the dead, I would never preach another funeral because I'd have nothing to say. If Jesus is still in the grave, then life is nothing but a cruel joke and death still has dominion. And it would mean there's no hope for the dead. There's no hope for the dying. There's no hope for us as the living. And he says in verse 19, he says this, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Paul said the most pitiful human being on this planet is a person who's placed their faith in a Jesus who is dead. That's a pitiful thing. Little boys one day got out. They are going to play some football. When they got together, they discovered that nobody had brought the football. And one of the boys said, never mind the ball. Let's just play the game. Well, that makes about as much sense, folks, as never mind the resurrection. Let's just get on with Christianity, right? Never mind the resurrection. Listen, Friends, without the resurrection, we don't have Christianity. We don't have it. Now, I know this is a beautiful day, and this is, a, this is Easter Sunday, and this Victory Day is the highest day in the life of Christians. And, and you say, well, Mike, that's, that's kind of a downer message, right? No message, no mission, no ministry if Jesus is in the tomb. But listen, have you heard it said before that the darker the dark, the brighter the light, right? Notice what he says in these next words. 
in verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Because listen, I've got good news for you today. We do have a message. Jesus Christ is alive. We do have a mission. We can tell everyone that Jesus is alive and that he will save them if they trust him. We have a ministry because Jesus is alive. We can offer hope to those who have lost their loved ones or those who are dying. We can offer hope. Death does not have dominion. Christ is risen, folks. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have not perished. In fact, Paul said in, in writing in 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, he says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. He's coming back to get us, folks. He's going to raise us to be with him. As much as I marvel at the virgin birth, and as much as I wonder at the sinless life of Jesus, and as much as I glory in the cross of Jesus, it is the resurrection of Jesus that makes Christianity unique and all the religions of the world. Confucius is dead, and he is buried. The Buddha rotted away with food poisoning. Muhammad died in 632, and his body was cut up and spread all over the Near East. But Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is alive. And on that single statement hinges all the hope of the human race because in this life and in the life to come, we have hope in the risen Savior. I heard about a Buddhist in Africa who was converted to Christianity. And they asked the Buddhist, why, did he, why do you change your faith? And here's what he said. He said, it's like this. If you're walking along, you come to a fork in the road and two men were there and one is dead and the other is alive. Which man's directions would you follow? Right? <laughs> and that really is the question. I want you to hear me today. That is the question. You have the right and you have the freedom to choose a dead Muhammad a dead Buddha, or a dead Confucius. But I want to tell you today, and I want to say it loudly, and I want to say it proudly, that I choose to follow the only one who is raised from the dead and who lives forever, and his name is Jesus. And I encourage you to do the same. Have you trusted in him? I'm telling you, he's alive, folks. And if Jesus Christ, listen to me, if Jesus is alive, that means all his claims are true. One who went to the tomb was dead and rose again, never to die again, not like Lazarus, not like Jairus' daughter. They were, they were resuscitated, but they were not raised like Jesus. And he is the first fruits of the resurrection, right? That means that all of us will follow in that way, coming later. And it means this, all of his claims are true. So that means that we need to bow ourselves to this Lord Jesus Christ and say to him, yes, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Yes, Lord, I know you died for me. I, I know you went to that tomb. And I know on the third day we, you came forth from that tomb. And because of that, Lord, you defeated death. You defeated sin. And I put my trust and my hope in you and you alone. If I didn't know Jesus is my Savior today, I would get saved right now. Because we're, we're talking about a risen Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. You came this morning and you didn't know what God was going to say to you. You didn't know what was this going to be like. Maybe you're here today. your first time being in a service like this and you didn't know what was going to happen. But I'm telling you about Jesus. He's your only hope. He's your only hope. Our hope is not found in men. It's not found in places like Washington, D.C. and other capitals of the world. That's not our hope. Our hope is not that the economy is going to get better. Prices are going to go down. That's not our hope. Our hope is Jesus. And I invite you today to put your trust in him. 
And Christian, I invite you today to realize that you have a message, you have a mission, and you have a ministry because we serve a risen Savior. Would you stand with me and bow your heads and